Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening this hearing as part of the series of hearings on No Child Left Behind we launched a week ago. The last week's discussion provided a broad overview of our reauthorization effort and gathered input from both the House and the Senate. I believe today's hearing and the others to follow will serve an even more important purpose as they delve into the real challenges at the heart of NCLB. Today we begin with an examination of options for improving NCLB's measure of progress. And I thank our panel of witnesses for joining us for this examination. Adequate yearly progress is the benchmark that, mark, that makes NCLB different from other education laws that came before it. It's the measure that tells all of us, legislators, parents, teachers, administrators, and taxpayers, exactly how a school is doing in educating students from one grade level to the next. And for that reason, it's vital that the concept remains in place. However, as we approach this year's reauthorization, it's important that we are open-minded to tweaks in the law that could make it more practical while ensuring that the underlying principle of accountability remains consistent. And that is where growth models enter into this discussion. Under current No Child Left Behind guidelines, school districts use a status model to compare the performance of students in a specific grade against the performance of the students of that same grade during the previous year. Some have raised concerns about the reliability of the status model. They argue that a model which compares the achievement of the same students over time within a growth model may be more appropriate and act as a more accurate measure of adequate yearly progress. As we reviewed the Department of Education's growth model pilot programs, as well as last year's Government Accountability Office report on the implementation of growth models to determine if schools in certain states are making adequate yearly progress under No Child Left Behind, I believe that growth models can play an important role in this reauthorization. However, these growth models must be well designed, they must be rigorous, and they must meet a number of criteria that are consistent and central to NCLB. For example, they must include the requirements that all students reach proficiency, that the gaps between groups of students continue to close, and the growth model is tracked as part of a state data system and that a state's assessment system must produce comparable results from grade to grade and year to year. With that being said, many members of this committee know as well as <laughs> anyone that the reliability and utility of growth models is the focus of an ongoing debate. So I think we all can comfortably say today that we're not necessarily here to wholeheartedly embrace the concept nor dismiss it out of hand. Instead, we're simply here to listen and to learn. I'm looking forward to this hearing and the additional hearings we'll be having in this series. And again, I thank the witnesses and look forward to their testimony.